Uh, okay, so, welcome everyone. My name is Xander, I use he, him pronouns, and I will be helping to f facilitate this important discussion on what it is to be school ready. I'm joining you today from the lands of the Cubby Cubby people. I have pale skin, have brown hair, and I'm wearing a maroon polo shirt. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that even though we are meeting virtually, and as I mentioned, I'm meeting from the lands of the Cubby Cubby people. We would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we work, live, and play. We pay deep respects to elders past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded, always was, always will be, that there is no justice without First Nations justice. I would like to encourage everyone watching to pop in the chat what lands they're joining from. In today's webinar, we're going to be discussing what school ready could mean for you, then some tips on information and supports. After this, we will have a five minute break. Then we'll come back together, answer audience questions and have some final reflections. Sada believes hearing direct from young people with disability about their experiences helps families, caregivers, and communities to have high expectations and aspirations for all children. We ask today that we are all respectful of one another and we are inclusive. Sometimes in talking about our experiences, we might get a question or cover a topic that is sensitive or includes tough stuff to hear. During this and other webinars, we use content notes. We will warn you what we're about to talk about is, for example, ableism or discrimination. People can choose not to hear the information. Later on, we might not want to answer a particular question posed and the CIDA team might step in. This isn't cancelling the question or shutting down the conversation. We want to make sure everyone's needs are met, yours and ours. Just a reminder that if you feel this webinar brought up some difficult or uncomfortable feelings for you, to please reach out for support. You can access help by heading to the SADA website. Um, we will put the names of these supports in the chat as well. So each panelist will introduce themselves, but today we have with us young people, Isabel, Emily, and myself. And from the CIDA team, we have Sue and Miranda. I will now ask each panelist to introduce themselves. Each person will also share with you what is their favorite memory of early school year, of their early school years, sorry. Isabel, I think we're starting with you. Thanks, Sandra. Uh, my name's Isabel. I've got pale white skin, I've got brown hair, and I'm wearing a grey top. My favourite memory of school was just meeting new people and making friends, and I enjoyed getting to do things that I wouldn't normally get to do, like playing musical instruments and doing arts and crafts. I just loved learning and loved being at school. Emily, over to you. Yep. Hello. I'm Emily and I'm a white Caucasian person uh, wearing a white uh, top and brown hair and red Harry Potter glasses. I think my first, well, my first and favourite memory of school is running on those little Try to get to go on in kindergarten and just spending time with my friends riding around on those little trikes. Isabel, did you share what your favourite school memory was? Or did you duck out of that one? I My cop out was that I just loved learning and loved getting to do things that I wouldn't normally get to do. Fair enough. Um, Xander, did you want to share your favourite school memory first? 
Um, hi everyone. Uh, just sorry, brain fart. Um, <laughs> just again. Um, I'm Xander. I use he him. Um, and I think my favorite childhood, um, not childhood, school memory, um, was during the many book weeks we had. I remember one year I dressed up as Pikachu. I always loved being someone else for the day, and I thought at the time Pikachu was pretty cool because it was a mouse with electricity. Fair enough. Um, Sue speaking. So, um, hi everybody. My name is Sue Tape, and um, I'm part of the Cider team. My pronouns are she, her. A visual description of me tonight I am a white, slightly larger middle aged woman with dark, um, uninteresting hair. Sorry, feeling a little, <laughs> feeling a little, um, self-reflective tonight and wearing black glasses um, and very, very excited to um, hear from Emily, Xander and Isabel tonight about their thoughts and experiences of school. Um, and I'll hand over to Miranda. Thanks, Sue. Miranda speaking. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Miranda um, and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm calling in tonight from Wurundjeri country. Um, so, I just blanked also, sorry. <laughs> this is our second webinar tonight. Um, a, a visual description of me, sorry. So I've got brown hair tied up in a bun. Um, I'm wearing glasses with a brown frame and it's getting a bit dark in my room so you can see the laptop reflection in the, in the frames. Um, I'm wearing a cream colored jumper and then my background um, is white walls. Um, I'll mostly be off camera tonight. I'm just behind the scenes um, helping with the tech and the slides. But please know if you, there's any de tech difficulties or if you had any questions, um, you can message um, CIDA staff through the like message hosts and panelists and then I should be able to see the message. Um, yeah, the other thing tech related that if you would like to turn on your captions, you should be able to do so, so sorry, like a live transcript or a subtitle down the bottom um, by choosing the more option and then the, the show subtitle. Um, one last thing I will add also while I have the floor is that my colleague Daniel um, is also involved, whilst he's not on camera, he's also involved in the session tonight as our safety and wellbeing officer. So it's um, pretty standard practice in all siders webinars and workshops um, that uh, we have a safety and wellbeing officer who's aware of the content and is contactable um, for an hour after the session, but also throughout the week afterwards, in case anyone felt um, just like they wanted to talk through um, what they heard more because it left, you know, any feelings of discomfort. So it's there for your safety. Um, it's also there for staff safety if we wanted to talk anything through, um, if anything hit a personal nerve throughout the content. So I will be using the chat to um, post Daniel's number. But other than that, oh, I guess, oh, and my favourite childhood story. So, um, from primary school. Uh, I grew up um, in early years, like in the country. So my my first years of schooling, what I remember was playing in like endless bush um, and our schools just didn't have boundaries that I guess suburban schools had. So I just remember making cubby houses and climbing trees and yeah, doing things that, yeah, um, getting dirty all the time. And I was just, yeah, have such fond memories of that. So Thanks, I'll pass back to Sue and the panelists. Thanks, Miranda, Sue speaking. And also just to um, share my favorite school memory was walking home um, and picking mulberries, um, which I think the leaves I was meant to be picking for the silkworms um, and eating the mulberries and being very grateful that I had a maroon colored check uniform to hide the mulberry stains. Um, so Xander, I'll hand back to you now. Um, just some housekeeping before we begin. Uh, like, um, like Miranda was saying before, sorry, read sorry. it the wrong way around. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a slide, there's a slide of cuteness there. Um, so many of the young people that have been involved in the webinars over the last couple of months um, were 
delighted or um, dragged into sharing their um, first day of school photo. So um, if you've seen any of our other or been part of any of our other webinars, this is um, their first day of school or, or, or approximately thereabouts. So for many of us, obviously, we were actually having to find physical photos, <laughs> um, myself, for example. Um, and so just thought it was a nice way to recognise um, how much we've all grown up and particularly um, where our young people who've been part of this, uh, these webinars have come from as well. So, sorry, Xander, I'll uh, go back to you. All good. Um, as I was saying, this webinar will have Auslan interpreting, which, will, which you will be able to see on the screen alongside whoever's speaking. This session, um, like Miranda was saying before, will also have live captions. Once again, if you're not able to see them, if you go to the bottom of your screen and go to more and then do press the CC button, you should be able to turn on live captions at the bottom of your screen. Um, also, please use the Q&A function to ask your questions. The session right now is being recorded to share with others. If you're having any technical difficulties, please private message our webinar support person, Marinda, in the chat. This is webinar number five. The earlier webinars covered inclusion, identity, language, and where to start with inclusion in early childhood. We also looked at the role of early intervention in early childhood and some tips on where to start with information, supports, and funding. The next and final webinar is in October and will recap many of the key concepts. Please head to Eventbrite to register or check out Cider's social media accounts. You can, you can also access this in all previous webinars from our website under the Early Childhood Issue page. I'm going to hand back to Sue now. Thanks, Sandra. So this webinar, I think, in September comes at a time when there is a lot of information flying around on the internet from schools from early childhood centres about the idea of being school ready. So we thought it was a great opportunity to have a conversation with many of our young members. So the young people that have been um, heavily involved with CIDA's um, advocacy activities and also um, obviously have very or more recent lived experience about um, the idea of school ready. So what we're going to do today is go through a couple of um, questions. So the young people have been asked to think back in time or check in with family members and to reflect on their experiences. So some will be good memories, some will be positive things and some might be less so. Um, so it's an opportunity really to hear direct from lived experience from the young people that um, have uh, you know willing to share with us. So the first thing I wanted to ask um, each of our panelists, um, and I'll start with Emily, is when you hear the words "school ready," what do you think it means? What does it mean to you? I think school readiness is about being able to be ready to be a part of the community. It doesn't necessarily mean academically ready or socially ready or those kind of tick the box standards that all children are supposed to meet, which it can be quite difficult for children like us, but about ready to jump in and learn and jump in and to be a part of a bigger world than just ourselves, I think. And I think most kids do tick that box when we come of age. Fantastic. Thank you. I think also that's a good reflection for, I suppose, family members as well, because um, if it's your first child or if it's a new school, you, you're stepping into a new community for that family as well. Um, Isabel, can I throw to you next? What do the words, I mean, Emily's already set, set the tone delightfully, but what about for you? What does school ready mean to you? Thanks, Sue. I agree with Emily as well. Um, school ready to me means that you're of age 
to start school and nothing other than that. Um, unfortunately, there are expectations surrounding that phrase that people have put those connotations in that spot that I don't necessarily agree with. Um, for example, ticking those boxes, like Emily said, like tying your shoes, for example. I didn't know how to tie my shoes until I was eight and I spent that long practicing and still didn't, and that didn't impact my ability to be at school. Um, and even as an adult, I still struggle to do buckles up on shoes. And that doesn't mean that I wasn't ready to, to go to school. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Yeah, I suppose it's it's looking for the um, things that are meaningful um, about, as Emily said, stepping into a new world, a new community and ready to learn. Xander, what about you? What does school ready mean to you? Um, I think to me, um, school ready means setting up everything so that the school understands all the needs of the child. Um, so like looking at all the appropriate adjustments required for them to participate like in the entire school environment, not just on an educational stance, but like on like a social stance as well. And so they can actually interact with their peers without feeling that they're isolated. So, yeah. Fantastic. Well, you've set it up beautifully for me, Xander. So, um, and we're not cheating. Um, so Miranda, can I get you to pull up slide 11? Because I think, um, all three of you have really kicked us off nicely. Um, what we really want you to do is to look at the idea of being school ready as being something that involves a number of people. So there's this delightful equation on the screen. Um, so we, the idea of being school ready is ready families plus ready early childhood services plus ready communities plus ready schools equals ready children. Um, so as part of your confirmation email for this webinar, you would have um, received a link to a Google Drive and in there is a worksheet that includes this equation. And I'd encourage you to have a look at that document um, and use it as a reference point or a, a notes page to think about um, where you fit in that equation, you know, which what's your role in the child's life that we're looking at um, for being school ready. Um, I'll show you a little bit um, in a minute of what else is on, on that worksheet, but um, this is the equation that we really want to think about, sorry, really want you to think about. And um, I'd like to say it's a, a cider idea or my idea, but it's not, as you can see, from the link down the bottom of the slide. Um, this comes out of something that was originally in the States um, that has been explored quite extensively in some Australian research as well. Um, and it's the idea that there's so many moving parts to being ready for school um, and that it's not just about the individual child. And as Emily and Isabel said, you know, that ticker box idea. Miranda, can I get you to go down to the next slide? So don't expect you to be able to read this on the slide. <laughs> um, and what I wanted to explain, though, is what's in the rest of the worksheet that's in that Google Drive link. So what we've mapped out for you is four sets of information. And I fully understand that that feels overwhelming, but they all have a different purpose. And we're going to talk about some of these things in detail with Xander, Emily and Isabel. But we wanted to make sure that you had links so that you could go to other places for further information. So the first one is planning the basics. So this has got um, links to ideas and um, information sources to go into some of the ideas that we're going to talk about today in more detail. Then later on, we're going to talk about the official information. So this is going to what are the policies and the regulations and what do each of the state and territory education departments say about um, preparing for school. And recognising that in each state and territory, there's almost a different name for that first formal year of schooling. Um, so the Queenslanders on the call will call it prep. 
Um, and there's a host of other different names as well. So um, then the third page on there says knowledge to help. So again, dipping into some of the things that will be important information for the families of students with disability. Now, not expecting anybody to be up on the disability standards for education on their child's first day of school. That is not the expectation, but it's something to consider so that, because tonight I know that um, Xander and Isabel and Emily will definitely refer to things like reasonable adjustments um, and some of the um, other things and words that are important in this space and maybe about funding. So wanted you to have some links for that. And then finally, the last page in the worksheet includes groups to connect with. So this is across the different states and territories. Um, groups and organisations that Sida knows very well that you might like to connect with. They also have some state and territory specific resources on their websites um, and a great opportunity to, to dive into some more information. The other thing that you will find on that last page are um, organisations that have resources based on stories. So Side is very privileged to um, have access to young people with disability and who are willing um, to share their experiences and share their stories. And a lot of those organisations too have those links. Um, and there's a lot of power in stories. So hearing what's possible, hearing how people have tackled certain issues. So I'd encourage you to have a look at other people's websites as well. So we're going to jump into it, um, what we'd like to do first is look at um, and hear from um, Emily, Isabel and Xander as to some of their suggestions and tips around, um, I suppose, some of those core basics. So thinking about where my child will go to school, what do we need, how do we prepare, and as Xander's already well and truly raised, preparing the school. Um, what sort of things do we need to discuss with the school to make sure the school is ready um, for your child and for your family? Um, so conscious as we are going through this chat um, that you may have questions. Um, so please use the Q&A function to raise those questions. You can do that anonymously. Um, there is a wealth of knowledge and experience um, in the room, and I'm talking about the young people on the webinar. Um, so uh, Xander is still at school and Emily and Isabel have experience um, in the education field as well, as well as their own personal experience. And they'll be reflecting on those different um, roads that they've taken as well. So let's jump into hearing from young people rather than from me. Um, so, um, Emily, I'm going to throw to you first. I've asked you to think about um, your experiences at school, good and bad, and what your suggestions are for families and their young children about some of the, the practical type stuff. What did you want to share with us first? So, for... Just to give a bit of context, I'm from Lotawina, which is Tasmania, and our school system is slightly different from the rest of the country. Uh, still figure, trying to figure out why, but that's how it goes. Um, so I started in kindergarten, which is four, which is optional, um, from just a quick Google on the ABS website, about 97% um, does kindergarten, so it's pretty high. And one of the main tips I think would be really important for that kind of getting ready for school kind of thing is that to walk in not having expectations because you know you're going to see other children like oh my children can you know tie two laces and count up to 100 and 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 you know do these amazing things and your child might not be there and that's okay and that doesn't mean they're not school ready it just means they're not there yet and as Isabel and Xander has mentioned, you know, they um, haven't, didn't tick the boxes at that age and neither did I. And um, that doesn't really change or affect 
what life might be like 10 years or even 20 years in, t in time. So just um, go with the flow and just take those little memories that you get along the way. For example, those little drawings that they beg and plead you to put on your fridge and those kind of things. So, yeah. Thanks, Emily. I think, can I just ask you a question? One of the words you used there, it's only got three letters, but pretty important in this sort of stuff, was yet. Can you tell us a bit more about how you feel about the word yet? <laughs> I think that when I did my human development classes and I've done a lot of human development, it's you never it can never end with your child and human development, is that children are on a timeline and they're on their own individual timeline and they will get there. Um, I have not met a child in my professional experience that hasn't had their own milestones or their own um, achievements. So, and it's really important to remember our own timelines. I mean, yes, those milestones and when they reach them, it was obviously the reasons why we have disabilities. But also it and it's really important to understand how these milestones into play with development and how it affects us academically, socially and emotionally. But also to realise that we have room to grow and there's potential there. Like for example, I remember when I first tied my shoelace at five and I got to stick it all over my jumper because my mother was furious because she spent a good half an hour trying to pick up all the stickers off my jumper to get ready for school the next day. But just to remember that proud moment of being able to tie my shoes the first time and then not doing it properly again until I was about 12. So just remembering those little small achievements and milestones and, yeah, realising that it's about the word yet and giving us a chance to grow because we're the same in that way. Thank you. Um, Isabel, can I throw to you? Um, we'll just wait till Kim and Matt swap over. Thank you. So, yeah, so the question was around um, suggestions or tips for families and their young children about those sort of first days, first teacher, communication routines, those sorts of things. Your thoughts on that would be great, please. Thanks, Sue. Um, just a bit of context about me too. I grew up in Darwin and went to school there. And the first year of optional, similar to what Emily was saying, school is preschool that you start around four-ish, um, usually five. Um, I was actually able to start preschool early on my fourth birthday which was unusual because my birthday's in November it's so late in the year um, but they gave me that extra time to start preschool early so that I could get used to um, the environment and get used to the routines and structure of school um, and that was possible because my mum is a teacher and she communicated with the school and made it very clear what my needs were, what my limitations were, and things that the school can do to make sure that I was included in as much as I could be. Um, so as a teacher now, that is my biggest piece of advice to parents as well. Because if I as an educator don't know what your child needs to be included, I can't help them and that's all that I want to do. So my mum used to communicate with my teachers daily, I'm sure annoying for them, <laughs> but it's really important to keep that line of communication open. Um, and also, um, I just didn't want to miss out on anything as well as a kid. So without her advocating for me at that age, I wouldn't have been able to have those experiences that I did have. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, all good. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, um, Isabel. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things in there, obviously, lines of communication um, and being able to be clear about um, how to set you up for success is, is what I heard as well. So, Xander, sorry, last but not least, um, what about you? What what do you think about um, when you want to make suggestions or tips for families and their young children? I think um, what's really important for families of um, young people to know is that 
being school ready is kind of for parents to be proactive and don't assume that your child's needs have been understood or communicated to all of the staff. Uh, you can be proactive by communicating clearly via regular emails. Not to say that it's a criticism to parents saying that it's all in their hands because if the educate, the educate, both the educators and the parents have to take the time to have good communication. So what's best for the child is communicated. Um, cause that's one of the, uh, more annoying things that happened in um, my primary school years is there wasn't there was communication between um, us and the support staff, but there was no communication between the support staff and the teacher. They were always disconnected, and that communication, establishing that communication before school even begins, and keeping that regular, I I think that's one of the most important things for being quote unquote school ready um because yeah that was one of the main things that was kind of a detriment to my early schooling was the communication so i think to be school ready trying to establish that before school even begins again is probably one of one of the most important things would it be fair to say that understanding who is who at school um, is one of the, the things that can be really helpful? So who's the principal? Um, what kind of other roles do they have? Do they have deputy principals for junior schools or something like that, particularly if it's a big school and there's lots of people involved? Um, and one of the things I always found helpful was knowing um, that the classroom teacher is responsible for what happens in the classroom they're the the buck stops there and that um obviously you've got support staff um Isabel you're going to say something sorry yeah just on that point about the roles in schools that I think is helpful um I'm not sure of the terminology in other states but in South Australia we have what's called a student support coordinator or like a person in a leadership position um that handles um all students with disability um and works with teachers very closely um, to make sure that personalised learning plans are written, um, goals are written, um, adjustments are being made and all of those things are documented as they should be. Plus, they're the ones that organise the support in terms of funding with support staff and things like that. So knowing who that person is, is really important as well. And my... Um very clinical and cynical analysis sometimes is understanding who has to do the paperwork, who makes the decision about spending money or sending staff out for training or bringing training in, and then also understanding who manages the people. So who supports the classroom teacher to be effective? Who supports the you know, teacher aid or learning support or, or other people involved and mm -hmm. to understand then if there are challenges in that communication, um, how do you raise issues without um, annoying or ticking other people yeah. off? <laughs> um, but just just understanding and, and knowing who's who mm -hmm. and feeling comfortable to talk to them. Yeah, it's... Oh, I, I had a thing I was going to say and then I forgot. Um it's i i don't know it may have just been a thing with my school um but again there was the person who was supposed to be corresponding with like the teacher to make sure things were being done in terms of like adjustments and whatever um but they were always on different wavelengths and that either one of them was super busy and one of them wanted to talk or one of them was super busy with like marking for example and I, I don't know whether they just didn't have the time, which they, they may have not had the time, but still it's, yeah, it, it was really weird because you'd think the person that's allocated 
to have that communication with the teacher would both of them would be able to have the time to communicate that but for some reason there was just a disconnect for a good like five years so yeah i think um one of the things i found really useful as a as a parent was um knowing what other parents i could ask questions of to mm. sort of find out how to approach those kinds of issues um so um conscious that 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 can be challenging if you um, are a full-time working parent and you don't have that opportunity to connect, you know, physically at the school um, or if it's a different sort of school where they don't encourage parents to step foot on the premises. Um, I know that that happens in some schools, particularly around COVID stuff. So um, I um, connected with the family that had five children already at the school because I sensed that they were all five very different children and, and that that parent would have some real insights as to how the school worked. Emily? Uh, just seems to add to what everyone else has been saying is a part of, I think, a really important part of school readiness is for the parents to understand the process. Because even in my experiences, because I'm in the Catholic education system here in Tasmania, which I pr primarily work with, and each section, like um, public, Catholic, and independent, have all have different processes. No, I have different um, ways of how to go around things. Like some may encourage you to talk to teacher aides, um, some less so. So if you're feeling a bit frustrated, the processes are there for a reason. And the other main thing I wanted to point out is make sure you do know the processes and do you do know how to kick up a fuss when you need to. Um, I'm sure Miranda will be more than happy to pop into the chat about the relevant depart public department in your state that will be relevant to know who to contact um, when things go wrong, because unfortunately they can. So that's just my recommendation. Yeah, and it's on the on the worksheet as well. Um, but also, um, the Australian Disability Legal Centre did a fantastic resource, which actually has some free training with it as well. And that there's a link to that in the worksheet, which is basically that you know when things go wrong or things aren't working, how do I tackle these issues? Um, and Miranda's also put in the chat, hot off the press today. Um, are some new resources for families, young people, educators um, about the disability standards for education. So there is a lot in there. Um, and they've been co-designed with young people and families with children with disability. Um, so there's a lot of information and there's a lot of helpful sort of um, workbooks and things like that. Um, but it's something that you can keep coming back to as, um, as things progress. So we might move on if that's all right. I know we've talked a lot about information already, but that's where we're going next. Um, so um, if you look back, and I'll go to Emily first, um, we're thinking about the official information, and we've kind of touched on this as well, getting to know um, your system that you're going to be in, um, what's the official story, <laughs> what's the policies that are on websites and those official stories have a couple of levels there's obviously the system so to speak so is it a government school is it a catholic school independent school and then looking on the website for the actual place where your child will go to school um, and then the other thing is um, looking at some of the things on the worksheet and also getting information about the school and the community around it as well because remembering that the school experience um, is more than just what happens in the classroom. Um, there's before and after school care to navigate. There's um, getting to and from school. How do those um, buses or parking or no parking um, work? So lots of things that you can find out um, how it all works behind the scenes. Um, so I'll throw to you first, Emily. What information do you wish your family had access to or what do you think would be most helpful um, ahead of being school ready? Oh that's a bit of a tough question because in a lot of ways I was a very privileged child 
from dad in education and mum in health so they kind of know who to talk to um but I think in terms of the whole family I think it's really important to um look at me as a child because I had an older brother who was already in the system a good 12 months before me and there was a lot of times growing up where yes it was beneficial to have teachers back to back where my brother say would have ex teacher and then I would have ex teacher and that was a really good progression for me however it's really important to differentiate that my brother is a different child and I'm a different child and to remember that to ensure the teachers have the resources to deal with me specifically I mean yes they would have a lot of interaction with me beforehand and meeting me beforehand but really going okay what does Emily need compared to my um older brother or even to my younger brother because we're three separate children with three separate needs so making sure that um the focus is on that and the teachers really focus on the child in question not siblings or cousins or other family members Absolutely. Thank you. Isabel, how about you from an information perspective? What, what are your tips? Um, my biggest bit of information, as you've spoken about previously, Sue, in terms of the standards for um, education, um, in terms of disability, the main point regarding that big ridiculous document is that a student with a disability is accessing education on the same basis as their peer without disability. That doesn't mean that they're not doing different things. Like, in my opinion, a person with a disability needs to have the same goal as their same age peer sitting next to them. Whether that looks the same as their same age peer is up to the teacher and how they think that that child can present that learning or that goal or whatever that is to the best of their ability. So it may look different from child to child, but it doesn't mean that that child is learning anything different than what their same age peers are learning. Yes, they might need to focus on some different things that other children might not need to focus on. For example, speech is a good example of that. Some children may come to school needing more extra help on their speech, some may not. And that's just an extra thing that they need to work on. Yes, it's important for their future development. That doesn't mean that they're also not working towards the goal, same goals as their same age peers. And I think for parents as well, once your child has a diagnosis, I think it's really important that you specifically know what your child is entitled to from that diagnosis in terms of support and funding to make sure that you can keep the school accountable for them providing your child that support and to make sure that they're getting the amount of time or whatever the specific support is, because sometimes I feel like it happens that schools think that parents don't know, so they the system is a bit wobbly in that sense. Yeah. So, yeah. I've got so many questions, but <laughs> I'm lulled for the moment. Um, Xander, information. What, what um, you're a little bit closer to uh, remembering <laughs> and uh, your mum is probably a little bit closer to remembering as well, but what sort of information um, do you wish or, or, or promote as people should have access to? Well, because I was um, a child at the time when majority of um, kind of um, school ready problems were happening, um, I kind of took my mum's perspective um, and asked her about it. And she, she kind of just said she wished that she didn't feel so lost trying to find information and second guessing if um they were being too difficult or asking too much of the school um because in the early days mum spent a lot of time wondering if she was being unreasonable when asking for like certain activities to be more inclusive um it actually took her quite a long time to um find the dis disability standards for education which have been mentioned a million times. Um, but when she just even glanced over those, it gave her the confidence to be like, I, I can 
push for the things that my child needs. It's it's not inconvenient. I'm allowed to do this. Um, and I think another thing um, that my mum mentioned is um, for the school support teams to do a child's IEP before school starts. Obviously, um, if, for example, your you have a late diagnosis of your disability for example it's not until like year one or year two like obviously you do it as soon as possible but if it's something you're born with um doing it as soon as possible for school starts means less stress for the student less stress for the school and less stress for everyone so from day one the child is set up for success um and a lot of things can happen in the first few weeks um and that's usually the time where they initiate the whole iep so independent education plan which can sometimes lead to a negative experience for the child because um their supports haven't been set up yet and so the school can't really do anything because that it's it's a it's a document they can't really <laughs> i i don't don't quote me on this but they can't really like properly do the adjustments that they need to do until that IEP is sorted out, which depending on school can be a week or so. It depends it depends on the state and territory um, as to how these things are um, explained to families. But the reality is that um, any child, regardless of um, diagnosis or um you know a piece of paper and some money is entitled to be educated on the same basis as their peers now acknowledging completely um Xander that there'll be many children that come to school like you said with a known syndrome or a known condition and the sorts of you know there will be some information about learning challenges you know um so, so that, that's absolutely a given. So, you know, it's a, that's a great basis on which to have conversations. There will obviously be lots of kids that land in school um, who may have things going on um, that haven't been um, identified in early childhood um, education and care or haven't been given a, a label, so to speak, and they're things that may, they may only uncover um, as they progress through the first couple of weeks, <laughs> first couple of months, first couple of years. Um, things like dyslexia isn't something that sort of stands out um, up front, you know, on the first day of school sort of thing. It's, it's really that progressive discovery of challenges, et cetera. But um, definitely the more formal process is something that does take time and need structure. And that's that whole thing of, you know, what's going on here, what resources do we need, so what money can we get, what pieces of paper do we need, that sort of stuff. I can see Emily and Isabel champing it a bit here. Um, Emily, I'll throw to you. And once we've um, heard from Emily and Isabel, we're going to have a break as well. But, um, Emily, over to you first. Um, yeah, sure. I'll put my hand down in a minute as I've just brought the page up just to... Um, in a way, set the story straight on what Xander was saying in regards to IEPs and things like that. Um, the Australian government have fairly recently released the National Consistent Collection of Data on School Students with a Disability, or the NCCD. It's a requirement for everybody in the school, from teacher aides, students to the principal, to collect data on the needs of the student and put them through a bit of a uh, a bit of a spectrum on from uh, if there's specific words, but for ease of act, ease to understand from mild to extreme. And these need to be picked up well and truly before an IP is in, IEP is in place to ensure funding can start rolling. Of course, this will take time and diagnosis does help, but the national consistent of data is, um, is a resource that we are using and it is, I, well, from what I believe, better than what we've had when I was a little five-year-old going through the system myself. Absolutely. Um, Isabel. <laughs> Thanks. Just off of what Emily just said as well, the NCCD is good because it doesn't 
take diagnosis into account. When a child needs an adjustment made for them, diagnosis or not, we do an NCCD for them to document that information so that the government knows um, what adjustments are being made for every child, regardless of diagnosis. And I was just going to say, in terms of students that I work with, I have lots of kids, I teach year twos this year, and lots of kids that I work with do not have formal diagnosis, but I make adjustments for. Um, and I we have a process that I put in referrals for when I think that things are not traveling as they should. And once kids get, once the referral's gone through and once they're on the list for the child development unit to actually get assessed, and then I complete all of that information, that waiting list is over a year long at the moment. So just in terms of timelines, it's just a really long process. And that doesn't, even though at that, at that point they don't have a IEP, that doesn't mean that adjustments aren't being made for them in the classroom. The other way to think about it um, is that I know that at the school my children attend, so a, a government primary school in, in Queensland, um, adjustments are made, for example, when people break bones or um, are undergoing chemotherapy and, you know, don't have the um, stamina for a full day of school or a full week of school. Um, there's all sorts of adjustments that can and, and should be made regardless of pieces of paper. Xander, over to you. Um, yeah, sorry. Just wanted to mention um, that that was from the perspective of I don't remember a lot of my primary school years, so oh, I can't sorry. <laughs> I can't say whether or not um, they did or didn't make adjustments before my IEP. I just wanted to clarify that. <laughs> um, yeah, to to let Xander off the hook. Um, unfortunately, there has been. Um, a fair bit of feedback to CIDA and, and to other organisations um, uh, in a particular state um, that uh, often schools would defer the delivery of adjustments by saying that they needed to wait for things like verification and funding and things like that. Um, but I suppose what um, I think what we're all saying, Xander included, sorry, <laughs> is that um, those processes should not get in the way of the conversations that need to happen and the adjustments that potentially need to be made. Because there's so many adjustments that classroom teachers do instinctively and um, you know, based on their training, regardless of what the disability or the learning need is. Um, so yeah, absolutely. So what we might do, it is 7.55 Australian Eastern Standard Time. We're going to take a five minute break. So we'll be back just after 8 p.m. Um, we're going to turn off cameras and microphones and all that sort of stuff um, and have a think about questions that you might have for our lovely presenters. And we'll speak to you soon. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on now to hear from um, Emily, Isabel and Xander about adjustments and supports. So the sorts of things that um, needed to happen for them to be successful at school. How did that work out? Um, and I, I know we've touched on some of those things already, but it'd be great um, to jump into that a little bit more. So I'll go to you 
first, Emily, um, and keen to hear from you, yeah, about um, supports and adjustments and what was successful for you. From the early age, because I wasn't diagnosed until it doesn't occur anymore, but in the 2000 to 2005 um, age bracket, they really pushed a thing called a prep check. And that's where my hearing issues got flagged. And then think the ball got rolling after that um, due to um, departmental procedures. But I think what the most important things is to remember, yes, there's policies and procedures in place, but remember we're little people and little people aren't the best behaved creatures at the best of times, let alone kids with additional needs. So I think one of the best um, adjustment that we had from what I remember as a kid was the fire alarm and it and it got to the point where I was obviously having meltdowns and I just wouldn't learn for the rest of the day and yeah it wasn't good that the adjustment was put in place that if they were doing a test fire alarm I would be told that day that there would be a test fire alarm but I wouldn't be obviously because it's a test you don't get told when it gets happened because that's the whole point of it being a test is that I get told that it's happening say okay it's happening on Friday and then it's Friday yep it's happening today but I don't get told when and then when it happens I'm already prepared already have my strategies put in place to ensure that I can get out there um not as stimulated and also prepared mentally and able to do what I needed to do um and learn how to cope in those environments much better than I would would be able to and it's one of those things that I suppose families can give schools an insight um at a, at a general level you know big changes in routine or um overwhelming sensory input can be destabilizing so I suppose those sort of general things and experiences and examples is something that they can share with school um, and help them manage that input as well um, Isabel, can I throw to you around adjustments and support? Thanks, Sue. Um, a lot of my adjustments were around um, physical activity just because um, that's the nature of my disability. When I first started preschool um, specifically, I had a lot of support, you know, climbing on the playground, um, getting onto swings, getting upstairs. Stairs are still an issue for me. I can't do stairs without a rail. Um, so that was actually something that they had to adjust physically at the school there just wasn't adequate railing that I could use um, and there was also another student um, in a wheelchair part-time that had come the year after me so the school actually had to change like they had to put ramps in and things that was obviously something that went through again the disability standards as well because that was impacting her ability to access the building so that was something that was done for her as well um, things that like Emily was speaking about before that she had trikes at her prep that was like where they got to ride and sit. I, when I started preschool, was only allowed to sit um, as a passenger, but then by the end of the year, I was able to actually ride the trike by myself. So that was a really big thing for me to be able to do. But without that adjustment and support from adults, I wouldn't have been able to do that. I think it's fair to say that um, schools are one of the most risk adverse places that you'll encounter. <laughs> and that there's I did a lot of falling over. Like that was just something that I did. And it worried my mum every day. I would come home with some other injury that I had done. And like as a parent, I can see that that is completely terrifying that you're sending your kid off to school and they've come back battered and bruised um but and me more than an, another child I was more battered and bruised than other children but I that for me taught me what my limits were and if I didn't experience those things as a young child I wouldn't have the ability now to be as self-aware as I am around my body and my limitations because now I'm able to, to prevent myself from being injured because I know what my limitations are and I feel like if I was a child and didn't take those risks I wouldn't be able to tell that stuff. Um, I was um, just going to add um, that 
one thing um, schools do a lot of risk planning obviously um, and um, a lot of sort of form filling and discussions about risk etc um, something I've found that is often a missing link is actually talking to the child about the risk <laughs> and that I've signed many risk assessment forms for the child but clearly she hasn't read them or signed them so they need to be communicating with her um, as well um, and yeah so Xander and Emily and, and others are adding in the chat as well um, yes so Xander I'll throw to you sorry now around supports and adjustments yeah um at school in um primary school specifically because that was kind of like the testing grounds for everything um i was set up with a slope board um which was originally designed for my writing and i was also given like thick pencils that were designed for poor f um poor fine motor skills um i also had these weird scissor things that you could like put like your whole hand into rather than having to like however you use scissors i don't know how to use proper scissors um this was uh eventually changed to the use of a keyboard as um as as many times as they tried to get me to write i couldn't write without subluxing my fingers um and uh, also um later on in year five and year six i was also assigned a teacher aid um that would help me because we had an elective where we could do like cooking and stuff and I really wanted to do that, obviously. So to be able to do that, um, a teacher aide did it with me, and that 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 was really fun. Um, and kind of kind of just a thing that came to mind, um, like now, for example, um, not not only am I disabled, but I am also a trans man. So um, I'm currently on medically prescribed testosterone, so my hormone levels are going rural. Um, and part of Ella's Danlos, which is my disability, is it's kind of like the autonomic system. Um, I don't know how to describe it, but it's basically the thing that regulates like your auditory um, he like hearing and perception and like smell and everything like that. Um, so basically, um, being on prescribed testosterone, that, that usual flare just goes like through the roof. Um, so throughout my high school years, um, I've had to get like, um, soundproof earphone headphones and whatever, because it, I, I get sensory issues now from that, which initially we thought hmm it could also just be um it could be asd but then mum mum and i did research and it's like no it's an ellis danlos thing um which surprisingly is not talked about a lot um specifically the autonomic system stuff it's more about the mental health imp implications from it and like the physical the more quote unquote obvious stuff yep. um but now in high school that's kind of adjusted to whatever which helps that they're not just being like you're not allowed to because you're not quote unquote this label so yeah i think also what i'm hearing from all three of you is that um families and schools need to consider that kids change over time <laughs> and that um things progress some things progress and some things don't um, you know those milestones might be achieved or they might not they might never be achieved and so I suppose it's that constant communication or or trial and error of different um, adjustments as well Isabel yeah I, I was just thinking about a good point um I have some kids in my class at the moment who are showing classic signs of regression in some ways and that's a really classic um it's just this time of year, like this term three time is really hard for kids. It's like everyone's tired, everyone's done. But also we might be regressing in certain ways, but they've also grown in others in exponential um, amounts. So I think sometimes it's tricky um, as a parent, if you're focusing on one particular thing that you want your kid to achieve, which 
100% have goals for your kids. But don't feel disheartened if they're regressing in one area because you might not be noticing that they're actually doing amazing in another. Um, so I think it's good to just have a holistic picture and also just remind yourself sometimes of, you know, a year ago or two years ago and just have that big picture of, I might not be seeing progress in this particular area right now, but that doesn't mean that I'm not going to in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sorry, so many questions, so much to do. Um, I just wanted to touch on something before we um, see if there are any questions from the audience. Um, there's been some magnificent work done on this and it's on, um, I'll get Miranda to go to slide 19 for me, please. Um, I suppose one way to look at this, the school ready question, is um, to think about what does a positive start to school look like? Um, and so there's been some work done, um, a fair bit of research behind this. It's not just us making it up. Um, so there's three, there's 15 outcomes on the screen here. Um, and there's a link, which I'll get Miranda to pop in the chat, but um, it's, it's sort of across children, families and educators. So if there's a positive start to school, the sorts of things that we will hopefully see is that children feel safe, um, and they feel positive about themselves as learners. Um, things like that families have access to information about their um, particular experience and the educators um, feel prepared and confident as well. So um, I suppose to what um, all three of the young people have said tonight is that um, you know, it's not about that ticker box type stuff, but looking at that openness and that readiness um, and the emotional um, preparation um, and not necessarily about emotional maturity, because let's be honest, a lot of kids in Australia start school at the age of four. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think um, I don't think there are terribly many, terribly many um, four year olds with huge emotional maturity full stop. Um, so it's about that um, setting up for them success at school as well. So I'd really encourage you to have a look at that document because um, while it's a um, Victorian based document, it's as applicable to any situation and, and um, any system. And I like how it talks about what we're sort of working towards and what a positive start can look like. The other thing to um, take into account is that it's never too late um, to, to keep going and to keep trying and, and have some communication. Um, so uh, before we wrap up this evening, I suppose throwing it open to the audience if there's any questions. Um, and if there's not, I will get each of the young people this evening to have some final reflections on what they would like um, families or um, families of young children or educators to take away from our session today? What are the things that you really want them to hear? Um, so we'll turn off the slides just now. And then Emily, can I get you to go first on your final reflections, please? So to take the biggest thing to take away, I think from the school readiness bit, is that it's really important to ensure that um, especially at the younger age younger age groups, remembering to ensure and to encourage that we are all little children, especially in front of the other children and their friends and things like that. And really important to be as much as we can be able to participate in everyday life of school. Like, for example, I want to reveal a little bit of a secret here that in the chat we've just been talking nonstop about our, ex our experiences and memories of Book Week. And um, uh, my fondest memory of being alongside my classmates, I remember this beautiful photo of, like, you know, our class shop, but in our little Book Week characters, and I was a fairy. So just having those normal childhood memory, school memories was a really important part of me growing up and it's important for that you guys encourage that, that your children have those same memories alongside our classmates because that's what all we want to do. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Emily. And Isabel? Yeah, for me, um, I think the most important part is communication between school and yourself as a parent and also the child when they're at that point where they are able to be involved in the conversation because it is the child's lived experiences as well and you as the parent obviously are having uh, want to support them as much as you can to be included on the same basis as their peers but as you were talking about so in terms of risk assessments and things like that um, these things also need to be communicated to the child and I think one of the best things you can do in terms of at home before kids start school is having simple routines in place and routines and expectations because that those are the two main things that we spend the first term at school teaching kids. So if they know the concept of a routine and expectations with a certain task, that they're going to be a lot more prepared for school than, than you would think. And even if that starts with a visual um, timetable on the fridge at home about what comes first and what comes next, um, some really simple ways to do that. Um, Xander, I'm going to give you the last word as the, as the youngest person in the room. I think um, the one thing I would like families of um, young children with disability to know is how important I found it is to not be afraid to educate the educators about your child's needs and not to give up on ensuring they are included on the same basis as their peers. I, I think this is really important because even as adults, literally any human regardless of their age is still learning they don't know everything in the world they're not a dictionary it's 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 okay to have to educate people on what your child needs it's not disrespectful or rude as long as you're obviously going about it in a respectful way um because again teachers aren't mind readers, adults aren't mind readers, they don't know everything. Sometimes they learn something new, people learn something new every day. Um, and I, I think that's the most important thing to take away from this. Thank you, Xander, that's a, that's a great point. Um, so a uh, couple of housekeeping things before we wrap up today. Um, we spoke um, earlier in the session about the support networks. So please jump onto the CIDA website um, as your first uh, port of call for access to numbers. Um, on the particular topic, please access the worksheet. Um, this recording will be on um, YouTube. Um, and it really is important um, for me to say thank you to Isabel, Xander and Emily. Um, not every memory of school is necessarily a fantastic one. So to sort of trawl back through those experiences and, and pull out the um, lessons learned and, and the wise advice is, is a challenging process. So um, I also want to reflect on that, um, please, uh, connect with CIDA, whether it be Daniel or um, um, either of the team, if you have any concerns that you want to discuss. Um, but a huge thank you to Xander, Emily and Isabel for sharing their experiences and sharing their insights. Um, we've all worked together on these webinars a fair bit over the last couple of months. Um, and I know that Miranda and I have just been blown away by how much we have learnt. Um, from being part of this experience um, and how much value um, that having young people as part of these discussions adds to the overall experience. So thank you. Um, and thank you to our interpreters, Mac and Kim. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> um, and yeah, final thank you. So Miranda's popped in the chat, Daniel's number, if anyone would like to um, connect. Please take care. Um, and we'll speak to you all soon. Thank you very much.